Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Ewan McGregor is back and he's spent just enough time aging in real life to comfortably reclaim the role of Ben Kenobi the Hermit in the deserts of Tatooine. Now, Obi-Wan Kenobi would spend almost 20 years in exile in Tatooine watching over Luke Skywalker, the son of his fallen apprentice, Anakin. During this time, he would face many great challenges, and today we're going to be talking about five of the biggest ones. Owen Lars is one of the few normal individuals in Star Wars. He's not a perfect individual, he doesn't have big, lofty goals or exciting dreams, but he tries to do his best by his family and fulfills his duties as the head of the Lars homestead. Owen Lars doesn't want anything to do with the wider galactic struggle between the Empire and the Rebels. He doesn't really care about what's happening outside of a small plot of land. And for this, for daring to live in a galaxy full of evil space wizards and out-of-the-touch vigilantes, Owen Lars is burnt to a crisp. Because there is no room for normies or cowards in Star Wars. Well, actually, Owen Lars wasn't a coward, far from it. When asked to bear the responsibility of taking care of his stepbrother's son, Luke, Owen Lars stepped up. Also, Aunt Beru was having fertility problems and really wanted a baby. When the Black Chrysanthemum attacked the Lars homestead, Owen did not cower in fear. He was just captured and beaten with stun cuffs, which shows that he's really not a great fighter. But when Obi-Wan Kenobi came to save him, Owen didn't run. He stayed and fought like a man and almost died as a result. Which is why I respect him a lot more for fighting this Wookiee than I do a Jedi with Force abilities. The risks are much lower for the Jedi. Uncle Owen actually cared a lot about Luke, and while he might have seemed like a harsh uncle, one that was always trying to limit Luke's curiosities and dreams, the one thing Uncle Owen truly feared was that Luke would follow in the steps of his stepbrother Anakin and go off into the wider galaxy and end up dead. Which is what Uncle Owen thinks happened to Anakin. And so Owen Lars saw Obi-Wan Kenobi as a threat to the younger boy. He knew that the Jedi wouldn't directly hurt him, but the more the Jedi was in Luke's life, the bigger the chance that Luke would pursue a dangerous career, like becoming a Jedi, instead of just becoming something safe like a moisture farmer. And so Obi-Wan Kenobi had to be really careful when monitoring and trying to mentor Luke from afar, because Owen Lars was always carefully watching the entire time. Joel Eikerton will be reprising the role of Owen Lars uh, when he first played Owen Lars in episode two, Attack of the Clones, which was actually one of his first roles in a feature film. So that's really exciting to see him come back. In Disney Star Wars, we've returned to Tatooine a million times. And I'm not just talking about The Mandalorian or The Book of Boba Fett. You also had the Clone Wars TV series and Rebels. And for the casual viewers, all of these individual storylines seem to blend into one thing. It's very hard to figure out what is happening when, what happens before, and what happens after. But from what I can tell, the series will be taking place in 9 BBY, 10 years after the fall of the Republic and 9 years before the Battle of Yavin. It's smack dab in the middle of Obi-Wan Kenobi's desert vacation. This also means that Jabba the Hutt will be the main power figure in control of the planet. Just two years earlier, the great drought of Tatooine meant that, believe it or not, this desert world got even more dry. Jabba the Hutt, of course, found this whole situation unbearable, and so he would send his minions around the planet to go collect taxes from the local moisture farmers. This water tax was being collected so that he could, not joking, take longer baths because of the heat. Jabba's men were also in control of many of the larger cities of Tatooine, like Mos Espa. They would run extortion and protection rackets all throughout the town. Some of Obi-Wan Kenobi's first battles on Tatooine will be against himself as he watches injustice and chaos control the streets of cities like this. The Jedi, first and foremost, are guardians of the weak, and so the first thing Obi-Wan Kenobi must learn is to temper his ego. He must find a way to look the other way when he sees people suffering and focus on his more important mission of keeping young Skywalker safe and sound. Oh, and yeah, he also had a deal with the Black Chrysanthemum who had been hired by Jabba the Hutt. And the only reason that Owen Lars was being targeted by the Wookiee in the first place was because Obi-Wan Kenobi had to rescue Luke Skywalker from some of Jabba's tax collectors. Everyone can now be realized that he needed to leave the population centers of Tatooine. Not only was it unbearable for him to witness the constant crime, poverty, and abuse of power going on, it also wasn't safe for a Jedi to be spotted roaming around. There were plenty of bounties being offered for the surviving Jedi of Order 66. Ben Kenobi would eventually set up his house in the Joan Blend Wastelands, the territory of several Tusken Raider tribes. 
While the Tusken Raiders' demeanor towards outsiders varied group from group, Obi-Wan Kenobi had more than his fair share of scuffles with the Sand Warriors. On one occasion, Obi-Wan Kenobi took a job protecting a Jawa Sandcrawler and ended up defeating an entire party of Tuskens. It would be interesting to see the Tuskens being betrayed in a more savage manner. The Mandalorian and the Book of Boba Fett's whitewashing of their crimes against almost every group of sentient beings living on this planet should be addressed. Also, it would make more sense for Mandalorians and warriors like Boba Fett to get along with the Tuskens, whereas the Jedi have always forsaken the path of being a warrior, so there is no common ground here. Now, in the trailer for the Kenobi series, it seems like the main threat that he'll be facing is the Inquisitors. For those of you who thought Cad Bane looked wonky in live action, well, the Grand Inquisitor's head is completely misshapen, and the fifth brother also seems kind of meh. And to be honest, I'm not that excited to see them here. They already served as the major antagonists in Rebels and Jedi Fallen Order and every other post-Order 66 Jedi survival-related story. The Inquisitors were sort of like this special operations task force that were independent from the military command chain and directly reported to Darth Vader and Palpatine. Their main job was to hunt down Force sensitives, and against half-trained Jedi like Cal Kestis and Ezra Bridger, they might seem like fearsome foes. But the reality was all of these individuals were young Jedi who were captured alive during Order 66 and then trained in the dark side arts. They were hardly the most talented or skilled Jedi and the Sith didn't really trust them enough to fully train them in the dark side arts, so they weren't considered full Sith either. The strongest of them all, the fearsome Grand Inquisitor, was just a humble Jedi Temple guard prior to changing sides. None of these Inquisitors actually represent a direct threat to Obi-Wan Kenobi, who should be able to defeat all of them easily in combat. But if they can find Kenobi, if the Inquisitors can uncover what he's protecting, that could be a really big problem. Obi-Wan Kenobi is being hunted by a lot of people. This is very apparent. But no one has more hatred for Kenobi than Maul. Kenobi. At one point in time, Darth Maul saw himself as the apprentice and eventual successor of Darth Sidious. He was a ruthless assassin who had slain one of the most powerful Jedi Masters in the Order. But his ego blinded him in that moment and he failed to take Padawan Obi-Wan Kenobi seriously, which is when he was cut in half. What happened afterwards for Maul was one tragic event after another. He was cut off from the Sith and basically his dreams were dismembered. He would eventually find his legs though and he would begin the slow climb back up to recovery. He would eventually confront Obi-Wan Kenobi in what is in my opinion the best scene in all Star Wars animated content. Obi-Wan Kenobi spent 20 years in the desert and just like Tommy Pickles who led his people into the desert for 40 years, he learned quite a lot while in silent meditation. And lastly guys, uh, because this is a entertainment channel, let us really be appreciative of the fact that we can still watch our favorite shows at home in the comfort of our friends and families because right now over in Ukraine, there are millions of Ukrainians who have either fled their homes, have been killed or wounded, or have joined their local territory defense uh, forces in order to stand up against Vladimir Putin's corrupt regime. So in the description down below, I have several different charities that you can donate money to. Most of these will aid civilians in Ukraine, but Army SOS actually does deliver um, supplies directly to the military. This is all non-lethal stuff. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below for the rest of our awesome content. I'll see you next time. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.